Hello guys, today let's talk about the skin. So uh, the skin has multiple functions. Of course, the primary is protective. Now this has to do with the protective mechanical protection from the outer environment, that's the first one. The second one, of course, is the, uh, and the protection when it comes to the loss of liquids, which is the, one of the primary functions of the epidermis. And of course, as, as, as a consequence, keratin itself. We'll discuss exactly how this happens and why. So there's thermal, there's protection from a loss of liquids, and of course uh, antibacterial of course because we have this is the first barrier of protection against uh, pathogens then we have the sensory function which has of course has to do with sensation light touch heavy touch and we'll discuss exactly the mechanisms and the nerves uh, that play uh, the whole role in this uh, the sensory function the thermoregulatory because the skin is the first medium the first uh, way and the first path in order to control uh, and to uh, facilitate the exchange of heat now in cases, of course, when the, uh, there is excessive heat uh, in the environment, then the human body facilitates and, uh, and copes with this difference by sweating. We'll discuss how sweating actually plays this role. And in the case of excessive cold, and in this case, we're going to see some effects, some specific, uh, let's say, uh, biochemical and, of course, uh, histological changes. For example, the vessels, there is vasoconstriction of the vessels in order to reduce the amount of blood that passes by the skin and as a consequence reduce the heat loss because don't forget the primary vessel for heat in the human body is the blood itself. This is the, the third one. Now the metabolic one, we'll see that different, different let's say, uh, metabolites, for example, the vitamin D that plays a role in the whole metabolism and in much more than just metabolism is primarily, of course, uh, formed and affected by the function of the skin. And lastly, uh, same as mostly, of course, mostly common in the animal kingdom, but also in humans, there is a sexual signaling by the ex expression of different hormones uh, by the uh, so by sweating and by other, of course, expressions of chemicals and specifically hormonal changes in the uh, products of the skin. Now, uh, first off, we have to I, we have to really specify what actually is the, the skin. Now, the skin is a, tr a three uh, structured uh, three structures uh, within one. Of course, the first one, outermost, is the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin. Then we have the dermis, the deeper and inner middle portion of the skin. And lastly, the subcutaneous layer, uh, or also called subdermis by some other textbooks. And we'll see exactly what each contains right now. So, uh, of course, the epidermis, we have already mentioned a few things with the stratified uh, squamous keratinized epithelium in the uh, epithelia in the uh, video of epithelium. And now, actually, we should mention it again. Uh, we'll see the layer, different layers of the epidermis within them. Uh, and by macrologic, mac macroscopically speaking, we should really identify in this picture the epidermal, the epidermal ridges. And of course, exactly beneath, we're going to find the dermis with the two sublayers, the papillary and the reticular. Now, the reason why we call the, pap the papillary layer papillary is because we have these dermal papillae, these projections over the epidermis. Now, why would exactly the epidermis have the epidermal ridges that practically uh, lock in within the epidermis, the papillary of the dermis, as, in, as a key to key lock? And in this case, of course, the, papilla, the dermal papillae facilitate exactly and fit perfectly with these epidermal ridges. Well, the point is that in order to maximize the adhesion between the two layers so that we have the maximal degree of, uh, of adhesion from the epidermis to the dermis, uh, we need to, of course, to have an increased surface area from the epidermis to the dermis. Now, if this line, if the papillary layer was not there, was just simply a straight line, then we'd simply see uh, a way lower amount of surface uh, between the epidermis and the dermis. So with this way, in this manner, we've already seen this mechanism many, many times in the digestive system. We saw them again in the kidneys. We see generally this logic of wave-like appearances, a wave-like structures in order to increase the surface area. So again, in this case, of course, the point is to maximize uh, the mechanical properties of the epidermis and to, to uh, ensure that it stays attached on the dermis. So that's exactly why we call it papillary, papillary layer because of the presence of the dermal papilla in this layer. Of course, within this layer, we're going to find also vessels, we're going to find also uh, nerves and different ending, different, let's say, ne neuronal structures to facilitate, of course, the sensation uh, that we saw already before in the skin. Now, in the second layer, the reticular layer, of course, the name reticular means network, of course, red from uh, uh, the Latin term. And of course, uh, here we're going to find different types of structures, such as glands, uh, sweat glands. And we're going to find, of course, uh, the uh, bulbs of the hair and other structures. We'll see them specifically in just a bit. And lastly, uh, we're going to find the subcutaneous layer, which, of course, is, uh, let's say, the cushion 
of the whole structure of the skin, which is filled with uh, loose connective tissue and, of course, high amount of adipose connective tissue or simply called fat. So let's start with the epidermis. Like said, let's talk about the epidermis specifically. We're going to find actually that there are two types of skin, the thick and the thin skin. The difference, of course, is quite big, and we're going to find the areas of the thick skin in the hands and the soles of the feet. So we'll see that, uh, practically speaking, volumetrically speaking, we're, in, we're talking about a difference of five to nine times. The thick skin is, in fact, five to nine times thicker than the thin. And, of course, this has to do with the mechanical properties of the area, because... Uh, or the, the areas where we have the maximal necessity for mechanical resistance and uh, stress-related uh, issues are the hands and soles of the feet. So in order to facilitate exactly this uh, increased necessity, we have this difference. Now, uh, we'll see exactly in just a bit, after we start discussing the layers, what type of layers are different within the thick and the thin skin. So before we do that, we have to first really comprehend all the different cells that we're going to find in the epidermis. First and foremost, we're going to find the keratinocytes. Now, these keratinocytes are, in fact, dead cells with no nuclei and just uh, the presence of uh, specific keratin uh, tonal fibers within them. So the point of the keratinocytes is that it actually they stay very, very uh, tightly interlocked and in touch in order to, of course, facilitate all the functions of the skin that we discussed before. Then we're going to see the Merkel cells. The Merkel cells are cells, neuronal cells, that uh, play a role in light touch. Then we're going to find the Langerhans cell. Now, the Langerhans cell are immune-related cells. Specifically, they are professional antigen-presenting cells. We already made a mention of this uh, in uh, the immune system. Now, these dendritic cells, the point of these dendritic cells is, of course, to phagocytose different particles, different part of pathogens, and express these antigens to specific immune-related cells, the B or T lymphocytes, depending on, the, uh, of course, the reaction we're going to have. And, of course, to, this is the first line of defense against pathogens uh, specifically. Then we're going to see the melanocytes. The melanocytes are cells that are responsible for the production of melanin, which already it's, this is a common knowledge that melanin is the, is the uh, compound, the protein that, in fact, protects uh, the nucleus of the uh, cells from the mutations of the UV lightning and other types of, uh, mostly for UV, of course, but, of course, also, as a consequence, other types of, uh, let's say, radiations. And we're, of course, we're going to discuss all of these mechanisms in detail in just a bit. Same as the nerve cells, we're going to have a specific part, we're going to talk about it in just a bit. So let's start talking about, we already know the, just the basic principles of what we find in the, uh, the layers of the epidermis. And so let's talk about specifically what we find in each specific layer. So first and foremost, we're going to find the first layer exactly above the basal membrane. This is going to be the stratum basale. As the name suggests, this is the basal layer. And as always, as the common and general rule goes, that the basal cells always have the rule and always have the, the, let's say, the responsibility of the mitotic regeneration of the cells. So whenever we have an injury or whenever we have any sort of loss of keratinocyte, then of course the satum basale initiates this increase in mitotic layer, mitotic levels, or mitotic rates to, of course, uh, support and to simply uh, fill in the loss that we had in the skin in previous layers. Now, of course, we're going to find in this cells, because of this hematologic rate, very, very nice and clear nuclei, very, very, let's say, uh, prominent in the in microscopy. We'll see them in just a bit. And, of course, this is where we first start. Now, exactly after this, we're going to find the stratum spinosum, or also called spinal layer. The name is not random, as always. Here, we start having the first process, the first steps of the keratinization. Now, uh, of course, in the southern cells, we're going to have the, the, in the beginning the initiation of the uh, production of specific uh, keratins. Now, keratins themselves are nothing more than just cytoskeletal parts, and specifically, they fall under the category of the intermediate filaments. So, these intermediate filaments are being produced, start to being produced in an excessive amount in the spinosum, southern spinosum, and as all we have, the, we know that the cytoskeleton generally is, of course, connected to different points of connection from one cell to the other. Uh, in this case, we're going to find that the intermediate filaments of keratins are actually uh, are actually joined and converged in the desmosomes. Of course, uh, we should know the desmosomes from the epithelium, the, the lecture of the epithelium. And of course, because of this convergence to the desmosomes, which are of course always in the uh, lateral sides of the cell and generally in the periphery of the cell, and these desmosomes, in this specific case, we're going to find the connections of all the different types of uh, of all the different sorry numbers of cells. Now, the proximal, let's say, the, the cells, the keratins that are exactly next to each other are going to be touched and connected exactly in the point of the desmosomes. 
So in other words, the desmosomes are the connecting point of the intracellular uh, keratin from the one cell to the other. This is exactly how the human organism assures that there is a very tight adhesion, a very tight uh, junction between the different keratinocytes in this case. So because we have these very, very tightly, let's say, constricted areas, again, on the desmosomes, we're going to start to see this spinal, uh, spinal, look, spinal morphology because the basal, of course, the cell is typical cuboidal. Now, imagine that you have a cube that you start to really pitch and stretch in the different sides. Of course, as a consequence, the morphology is going to be that of a spinal uh, cell of this spinous uh, processes. And of course, this is a direct result of the connection of the keratins uh, exactly on the desmosomal points. Now, all these filaments of keratins together that are conjoined are actually constitute the tonofibril. So this is exactly when we hear the term tonofibril, it means exactly that. It means the bundles of keratin that are actually connected and connect the one cell to the other. The cytoskeletal components of each keratinocyte in this case will be actually touched and joined in this case. Uh, now, uh, exactly after the stratum spinosum, of course, the upper, the exactly immediate layer uh, after that will be the stratum granulosum. Now, the granulosum, as the name suggests, of course, is the layer of the, gr the granular layer. And of course, again, the, the, the name is not random. This is because we find two different types of granules in the stratum granulosum. We're going to find the keratohyaline granules, which the point of the keratohyaline granules is to contain uh, uh, components, specifically filagrin, a specific protein that assists the process of keratinization and the strengthening of these joints and the connections of the uh, of the tonal fibers and the keratins in general. So this helps with a more a better architecture of the 3D structure of the keratin of the tonal fibers in of keratins exactly uh, because of the function of this uh, keratohyaline granules. The second granule we're going to find is the lamellar granule. Now the lamellar granule is a structure is a granule that contains a high amount of lipids. The question is why would we actually have lipids exactly in this layer? Well because the point of course of keratins evolutionary speaking is to uh, be for is to be able to allow for the human body to be resistant to water loss because according to Darwin's theory after the uh, after we escaped the seas and we went from the uh, let's say from mammals that were exactly in the sea, then we went out of the sea. The point, of course, and the difference is that we have to be able to withstand the heat of the sun in order to maintain the volumetric and the volumes, of course, of the liquids within the uh, the body. So exactly this is where evolutionary speaking keratin was the perfect tool to do exactly that. It was the perfect protein, the perfect, let's say, uh, intermediate filament that prevented and prevents water loss. So what is and the ideal barrier between water of course lipids lipids are hydrophobic and they do not tend to mix with water so exactly because of this this production of the lamellar granules in this layer we're going to have this double protection from water from both losing it from the skin from the deeper layers of the skin uh, to the outer environment and vice versa of course always as we know of course this is not a perfect process and of course this is just this maximizes and let's say allows the better degree of, uh, of isolation from water. Uh, so this is exactly the two different grounds we're going to find in the stratum granulosum, okay, the keratohyaline and the lamellar. Next up, we're going to find the stratum lucidum. Now, the lucidum is the layer that is found only in the thick skin, and there are many actually, uh, let's say, hypotheses of why exactly this layer exists only in the thick skin, and they all tend to be because of the, mecha the increased mechanical compression of the, these areas of the hands and soles. Uh, so this is a very short layer, only th two to three layers of cells are present within this stratum lucidum. And lastly, we're going to find the stratum corneum, the most superficial layer that have a lot of layers, up to 30, uh, if I'm not wrong, up to 30 layers of uh, skins of keratinocytes. And in this case, of course, this is where we're going to find the maximal degree of keratinization, the peak of this, uh, of this, uh, this capacity to minimize water loss uh, and resistance from, of course, all this function that we discussed in the skin. And this is exactly the point of uh, the peak of the function and the peak of the property of the skin, of the epidermis. So some scientists actually claim that the keratinocytes are not, in fact, cells because there's this, uh, this, this let's say, 
disagreement within scientists that all the cells that are nucleated are considered cells and some scientists say that cells any any structure that is not nucleated should not be considered a cell so this is just a more philosophical point uh, when it comes to the function of the uh, when it comes to the classification of cells or not so uh, I also wanted to mention this this term that you might actually see in textbooks and in maybe maybe an exam the uh, the term germinativum this is the stratum germinativum stratum always means layer so this is the layer of the of the germination the the, the layer that we have the uh, mitotic the increased mitotic degree now when you hear the term stratum germinativum you should immediately think that this is the basale along with the spinosum because we still find uh, mitotic of course rate mitotic events within the stratum spinosum so this is exactly the term that you should know uh, that is the stratum germinativum Lastly, I wanted to talk about the uh, epidermal uh, melanin unit. We're going to talk about it just in a second based on the color. This has to do with the coloring of the skin and the different components that are actually utilized uh, in order to achieve the, difference, uh, the different tones in the skin. So, of course, the, we have, the reason why our skin is exactly this color uh, is because of the, uh, the three, different, three different, let's say, components that uh, work with the reflection and actually have this, res this result. One, of course, is melanin that has to do with the more darker uh, the darker uh, let's say component of the skin carotene is the one that gives it a more let's say uh, a carotene appearance a more orangey appearance and lastly of course is the blood vessels because we have the excess amount of vessels in the dermis we'll see that the dermis is filled in fact with a very very uh, and richly vascularized area this is exactly why we have this specific tone of color because of these three uh, components playing the different roles in the different parts uh, of course, these uh, mixtures, these proportions of melanin to carotene and melanin to blood vessels are responsible for the darker colors of skin, the lighter colors of skin, and so on and so on. So uh, one event, one color that is not typically actually seen uh, in the, with these three, uh, with these three, uh, let's say, uh, structures is the uh, red color. Now this, the red heads and the red head people actually that have this very, very unique uh, color. And this has to do with the type of melanin. There are two types of melanin, the eumelanin and the pheomelanin. Eumelanin is the more commonly known and the more commonly seen in populations, of course, uh, that is the, uh, the color of the darker tone, tone of the skin. And of course, the pheomelanin is the one that is responsible for this unique red color of the skin. It is important to notice that uh, melanin actually, the whole production of melanin circle plays, uh, is of course integrates within it uh, tyrosine and this is one of the most, one of the initial points biochemically speaking in order to produce melanin. So any sort of uh, genetic variations we have for the, uh, let's say the uh, changes of uh, tyrosine actually results into different uh, skin defects and skin colors in the, uh, in different cases of, uh, of, let's say of other types of uh, skins and so on. So what is really interesting to see is the system of melanin tr transport and exactly why is that? Well, because we know that uh, the point of melanin is to protect mutations, DNA mutations uh, from the sun. So uh, if, if you were just a second, if you were actually thinking of where would you deposit the melanin? Where exactly? The logic is that the cell and the cell, the melanocyte will produce the melanin in granules and after some point actually extend with the cytoplasm process to encircle many different types of uh, cells. So uh, after the deposition and the degranulation of these of the melanin granules, the cells actually phagocytose the granules and tend to deposit, of course, the high amount of melanins surround uh, that surround the nucleus. And this makes perfect sense because the ideal location to protect your DNA would be again surrounding the nucleus, which is deposited within it. So uh, this structure is actually very very brilliant, and the deposition is strategically placed in order to maximize the uh, the output of melanin so this is exactly the structure and why we should you should know the name uh, of the unit so now let's talk about the dermis the different layers of the dermis so I already discussed the papillary and why we call it papillary and we already mentioned just the few structures that we discussed in the reticular layer again to sum up in the papillary we're going to find uh, our connective tissue of course in different forms dense and loose and uh, we're going to find of course in this case is a high amount of vessels and of course uh, nerves that pass by either end and stop exactly in this layer or are actually uh, penetrating the, the highest layer layers of the papillary. Exactly then we're going to find the reticular which is going to be filled with, uh, with glands. Specifically we're going to see actually sebaceous glands. We're going to see the hair follicles. We're going to see 
Uh, what else? We're going to see also egg, eccrine and apocrine glands, sweat glands, in other words. And we're going to find that there's very, very rich, uh, let's say, quite high amount, high amount of variety of structures in the reticular. We're going to see them in the microscope in just a bit.